Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's good to see each and every one of you here. It's good to have Elder Sankey and Sister Sankey back with us, as well as the, the young white family as well. Been away for us for two weeks. Good to have them here with us. Um, at this time, I want to invite us um, as far as possible to, uh, to kneel as we have our uh, worship sermon at this time. Let us pray together and for one another. Eternal Father in heaven, we thank you that the coming king is at the door who wants the cross for sinners born. And we know that those that are looking for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And our desire is that you would revive the work in the midst of the years in the midst of the years that you would make known, and in wrath that you would remember mercy. We pray, Father, for a revival of the mighty work that took place in the years of 1840 to 1844. We desire a revival of primitive godliness that has not been seen since apostolic times. And even during the time of the the Millerite Second Heaven Movement, the history of the midnight cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. Father, we're praying for a spirit of consecration. We're praying for wisdom and understanding from on high that as we revisit our sacred past and also the prophetic legacy that you have given to the remnant church that our hearts would burn within us and that it would move us to action, that a, an impetus would be given that would prepare us for the mighty loud cry of the third angel, which would be a culmination of that message, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. And so thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your angels. I thank you for your presence that gives us rest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, we also welcome our online viewers, and my name is Dario Taylor. For those of you that may not know, I am chosen today to give the, the sermon hour, and I'm excited to do so because this weekend is very sacred, very precious uh, to those of you that are students of um, Adventist history, seven-day Adventist history. For today actually marks the day after the great disappointment of October 22, 1844. So about 177 years ago, there was a group of about 50,000 Christians or so. The world dobbed them as Millerites to, to mock them and to ridicule their faith in the second coming of Christ there in the New England area. And, of course, we know that they were disappointed. They were preaching a message based upon prophetic time. They believed, based upon the books of Daniel and Revelation, that Christ would come to the earth to cleanse what they thought was his sanctuary, only to find out that Christ did not come to the earth as promised, although he did come on October 22, 1844, not to this earth, but rather to the Ancient of Days in heaven to begin the work of the investigative judgment, the blotting out of sin, the cleansing of the sanctuary from sin, and to seal God's people. And of course, they did not fully comprehend all of what I told you. That would take some years after the fact. Uh, but today, we will commemorate that weekend that transpired, and of course, this is going to begin a new series for us. Um, our message today is entitled, Lest We Forget. 
Uh, for we have been told in Life Sketches, page 196, that we have nothing to fear for the future except we forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. So many of you know that we are preparing, by God's grace, in April of next year to go on an, an Advent history tour. And by God's grace, if you attend, you'll be able to stand in the very cornfield where Hiram Edson had his vision of the sanctuary in heaven according to the book of Hebrews where he saw Christ move from the holy place to the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. We will also go to William Miller's farm where that mighty man of God who was a farmer then turned preacher after wrestling with God one hour in the maple groves where he responded to the voice that I have made thee a watchman unto the world and you are to tell it to the world. You can also go where his grave is as well, not too far down from his home where angels that watch the precious dust of his servant are still there at his gravesite. And also Joseph Bates' boyhood home in Fairhaven, Massachusetts, and many other places. From this point on, when I have the opportunity to speak, we will be speaking about the sacred history of Adventism. And I sort of um, style myself where I flatter myself to be um, what one would call maybe a, um, an Adventist history nerd, so to speak. Um, a layman, of course, um, not necessarily a professional um, by the standards of our church, but by God's grace, I'm hoping to stir up, to revive, to motivate, and to encourage us to make plans to be there in April. And so by God's grace, we will be going through and looking at some pioneer history, um, looking at some of the men and women that God chose, um, gave the first, second, and even third angel's message to, and hopefully, um, as I said, it would bring about a revival in our hearts and our minds of mission, of prophecy, and as well as of righteousness. And so today I want to begin in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 10, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4 rather. This is part one and I'm hoping by God's grace not to be too long-winded or to feed you with too much butter and honey lest you vomit and get sick. We don't want you to get sick. We don't want you to um, not be able to retain the information that the Word of God will give to us. And because we have an indefinite period of time, we don't have to try to rush. We could take our time. So Deuteronomy chapter 4, beginning here in verse number 5, lest we forget part 1. This is really just going to be a, a foundation as to what we will be studying for the next uh, couple of weeks and months leading up to our New England history tour, our religious liberty and SDA history tour. Deuteronomy chapter 4, beginning in verse 5, the Bible says, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do so in the land whither you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations which shall hear all these statues and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statues and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. So there's a warning to not forget the words of the Lord, 
his covenant, his message, the great and marvelous signs and wonders that God had done for leading his people out of Egypt into Horeb that they might become his denominated people, his chosen representatives or depositaries of truth in all of the world. And this knowledge was to be taught to the children and to the generations that will follow after. When we look in verse number 22 and 23, we see the reason why we are not to forget our sacred history and our prophetic legacy and heritage as a denominated people. In verse 22 of Deuteronomy 4, it says, But I must die in this land. I must not go over Jordan, but you shall go over and possess that good land. Take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make you a, what everyone? Graven image or likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. So if we would forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history, then God's people would actually be led to make a graven image and would worship idols and their hearts would go a-whoring after other gods. They would be like the other nations round about them. Deuteronomy chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. As a matter of fact, the whole book of Deuteronomy is, is the repeating of the law. It was the most important message that Moses could give to his people, knowing that he was going to die and no longer be able to lead them. And he would be laid aside to his rest. And the burden of his heart was Israel, because he knew that as soon as he would die, they would rise up and go a-whoring after other gods. They had been rebellious ever since he had known them, and how much more after his death. And so he was trying to prepare the people as they would cross over to Jordan, into the Promised Land. They had already met with the final crisis, the apostasy at the Jordan, where they had to deal with a threefold enemy of Balak, the king of Moab, Balaam, who became the false prophet, and also the daughters of Moab, or the harlot women. And the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 8, verse 1, All the commandments which I command you this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord sware unto your fathers. And thou shalt forget all the way. Remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou would keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with man of which thou knewest not. Neither didst thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. And coming down now to verse 10. In verse 10 it says, When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God. In not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day, lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thy heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God which brought thee forth by the land of Egypt out of the house of, from the house of bondage. So what would cause God's people to forget the Lord in keeping his commandments and not remember all the way that he had led them through the wilderness for 40 years? It's prosperity. Thank you. It's when they had eaten and were full. It was when their flocks and their herds multiplied, their houses, even their silver and their gold, that their heart would be lifted up in self-exaltation and they would forget the Lord. Now, of course, when we look at the last church in Revelation chapter 3 called Laodicea, the Bible says that they are rich and increase with goods and feel that they don't have need of anything, but they know not that they are poor, blind, wretched, miserable, and naked and were about to be spewed out of the mouth of God. So again, when God's people enjoy spiritual riches or even literal riches, this is when we forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching and our past history as we go after the gods 
of this world. The Bible tells us that we were to teach our sons and our son's sons because they would actually ask us questions as to why we do what we do. Why do we worship the way we worship? Why do we believe the way we believe? Why do we eat the way we eat and dress the way we dress? Why is it that the music we listen to and the things that we watch on television are to be different from the world? And we were to be in a position to give them an explanation of why we were a chosen generation, a peculiar people, a royal priesthood and a holy nation that should show forth the praises of him that have called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. The Bible says in the book of Exodus chapter 10, what book are we going to? And what chapter? Chapter 10. In Exodus chapter 10, beginning in verse number 1, there's a reason why we were not to forget one of the ways that we don't forget is by rehearsing it. It's by repeating it. That's why Deuteronomy is called the repeating or the giving of the law once again. And it rehearsed all the history of their travels that they had gone through since they left Egypt, even to the passing through the Red Sea and the idolatry of Mount Sinai and the 40 years of the wilderness where they tried and tempted God 10 times and even that generation that had done so was not alive when the book of Deuteronomy was given. It was the children of the parents that rebelled against God that were alive to hear the book of Deuteronomy. And that was important because as you're going into the land of Canaan, if you don't remember how the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history, then you have everything to be fearful of and you won't be able to stand and to do the work that you've been called to do in conquering Canaan under Joshua and the judges. But the Bible says in Exodus 10 verse 1, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have heart in his heart, and the heart of his servants, that I might show these my signs before him, and thou, that thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son, and of thy son's son, what things I have wrought in Egypt, and my signs which I have done among them that you may know how that I am the Lord. So how were our children to know that the God of Israel was the true God? It was by telling them of the signs and the wonders and the work that was wrought in Egypt. It was so that they would have an experience of the things of the living God for themselves and not just follow their parents or their grandparents or their aunts or their uncles or guardians. In fact, the Bible goes on in the book of Exodus chapter 12 as we come to the Passover, which we know was most important because this was the 10th plague. We also know that they were to be delivered by the blood of the lamb. That blood was a marking or a token or a seal upon their houses to protect them from being destroyed by the death angel. And in the book of Exodus chapter 12, as they were to slaughter the lamb, they were to eat him roasted, and also with bitter herbs. They were to eat it with their uh, loins girded, their staff in their hand, and their shoes on their feet as they were preparing to exit out of Egypt. This was an Exodus Advent movement, as it were, out of Egypt. And Exodus chapter 12 tells us, beginning in verse number 25, Exodus 12, 25, and it shall come to pass when you be coming to the land which the Lord will give you according as he hath promised, that ye shall keep this service. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you what? What mean ye by this service? What does this mean? What, uh, what is this lamb? What are these bitter herbs? Why are you doing it with your staff in your hands, your loins girded and shoes on your feet? Why do we have to strike the uh, two side posts in the upper lintel with the blood of the lamb? What does this mean? The Bible says in verse 27 that you shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and, and delivered our houses, and the people bowed the head and worshiped. And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. So again, we have to give the interpretation. We have to give the application and the understanding to our children or, and our youth as well. Exodus 13. Exodus 13, the next chapter over. You see that this is something that's repeated over 
and over again because religion is not just for grown people, so to speak, or for elderly people. Some people think that you go to church when you get old. After you've had a good time, after you've lived your life and you've had fun and did all that you want to do, now we're supposed to settle down and grow old gracefully to a ripe old age as we go to church. Nothing could be further from the truth. God always had in mind our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren when it comes to the things of heaven and eternal life. The Bible tells us in Exodus 13 and verse 8, And thou shalt show thy son in that day, saying, This is done of that which the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. That's a personal experience. Verse 9, And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thy hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes, that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth, for with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. So when the Bible says that it shall be for a sign upon your hand, and a memorial between your eyes, that the Lord's law might be in your mouth, what does that mean, a sign on your hand? And a memorial between your frontlets or your eyes. That's a seal. What would be as a seal on your hand and also between your forehead or on your forehead between your eyes that the, the law of the Lord's, uh, that the law of God might be coming forth out of your mouth? What would be a sign? In verse number eight, and thou shalt show thy son in that day, saying, This is done because of what the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. In other words, as you rehearse the history, of how the Lord led and delivered out of Egypt, and you related faithfully to your children, that was to prepare the way for the sealing work among our children. That was to seal them with the law of God. So again, teaching and showing how God has led in our past teaching and history, that's part of the sealing work to keep us from falling away, but that we might be settled into truth both intellectually and spiritually so that we cannot be moved. And once again, we find in the book of Joshua chapter 4. Joshua, what chapter? Going to chapter 4 now as they are about to, as they are crossing now the Jordan. There was specific instruction that Joshua was told to give to the children of Israel, there was something that they were to commemorate as they were passing through, and it was something that was done so that it could be taught to the future generations. In Joshua chapter 4, beginning in verse number 5, Joshua chapter 4 and verse 5, and Joshua said unto them, pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan. And take up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Fathers, do you know what these stones mean? Mothers, do you understand what these stones mean? Grandmothers and grandfathers, auntie and uncles, guardians, do you understand what mean these stones, 12 stones, each for the tribes of the children of Israel. The answer, verse 7, Then you shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. So again, there was a question from the children. The answer comes from the fathers because the fathers unto the children are to make known thy truth. So we've seen all these texts about all the instruction and the education that God's people were to give to their sons and daughters when it came to their religious instruction and also understanding the foundations of their faith, the pillars of their faith, and why we believe the things that we believe. Now, what would happen if the parents neglected this work and did not educate and teach the children? Let's just say that they forgot themselves and did not teach it to their children. What would happen to the new generation that would come up? Do you think that they would serve the Lord? Do you think they would keep his commandments? 
that they would remember the Sabbath, that they remember that they are peculiar uh, people and that they are to be a holy nation, a kingdom of, of, of priests. Listen to what the Bible says as we go to the book of Judges now. Judges, the second chapter. What would happen if we just stopped teaching denominational history and how God led and the signs and the wonders and how every theological tenet and point was developed among us as a people. What would happen to that generation that would rise up? Would they complete the mission that was started by their fathers? The Bible tells us in the book of Judges chapter 2 and beginning in verse 6, it says, And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Harris in the Mount of Ephraim on the north side of the hill Gaash. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Oh, we're in trouble now. We have a lot to be, to be fearful of at this point. Listen, Joshua and all the elders represent the pioneers that all died off now. That generation that knew the Lord and saw the great works that he had done for Israel that went through that experience in the wilderness. And it was important for Joshua and Caleb because they were among the, the few children that were still alive when the book of Deuteronomy was given. Now, what's going to happen with this new generation that rises up and does not know the Lord? Neither the works that he had done for Israel, all the signs and wonders that he had done in bringing them out of Egypt. The Bible says in verse 11, And the children of Israel did good in the sight of the Lord. They did evil in the sight of the Lord and served who? Balaam, the sun god, or Satan himself. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods, the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. This is always the fruit of forgetting the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. This is the outcome that will take place always 100% of the time. We find that the reason why our church is in apostasy and why we don't understand what we believe and why we have plenty of ministers and theologians and scholars and pastors that do not believe October 22, 1844, even today, is because we have failed. We have forgotten. We have not been teaching. We have not been instructing. Most people know nothing about Millerite history or the 10th day of the 7th month movement or the midnight cry. Don't understand anything of all the foundations and pillars and how they were laid. Understanding the first, second, and third angels' messages, they don't know anything of what that is. But simply, we've grown up in this church. We've gone to church on Saturday, and we don't eat pork. We believe Jesus is coming, and really, that's, that's about it. So this is why we're like the other churches, the other first-day churches. That's, that's why our ministers are trained to preach like them and to do evangelism like them, and the music styles, the worship styles, the dress, the health, the diet, the theology, all savers of Roman Catholicism or apostate Protestantism because of a fulfillment of a warning that God has given to each successive generation. When that work is neglected, this is the reason why we have many standing in our pulpits today 
with the torch of Satan in their hand, kindled, uh, the, the torch of false prophecy kindled from the hellish torch of Satan. This is the reason why. It's creeping compromise. And we have neglected our work. And the sins of the world lie at the door of the church. All are implicated. All are responsible. As a matter of fact, we look in the book of Jeremiah 18. Listen to what it says. The book of Jeremiah 18, beginning in verse 15. Jeremiah 18 and verse number 15. And it really doesn't matter what type of Adventism you, dis- you subscribe to, whether it's uh, main line or short line, regular, irregular lines, whichever you want to call it, all of God's people are in trouble today. All have fallen away. You'd be hard-pressed to find anyone that truly understands the signs and the wonders and what God has done in leading us out of Egypt. Did you know that we also had a Red Sea experience where God delivered his people from Egypt? Did you not know that the same way that the Hebrews were tested at the Red Sea, that God's people were tested in 1844? These are some of the things that we need to learn about, some of the things that we need to be studying about. Because if we're going to find that if we don't understand this past history, then we're not going to play a role in doing what God has called us to do in the last days regarding the giving of the loud cry of the third angel. And if you're not giving the loud cry of the third angel, that means you're going against the third angel. And if you're going against the third angel, you probably will worship the beast and his image and receive the mark in the right hand or in the forehead and not receive the seal of God. It's one or the other. There is no in between. Jeremiah 18.15 says this. Jeremiah 18.15, because my people have remembered me. They've forgotten me. They have burned incense to vanity. And they have caused them to stumble in their ways from the ancient paths to walk in paths in a way not cast up. See, we forget the ancient paths. We're burning incense unto vanity. We're worshiping the sun. We're deceived by spiritualism because we have forgotten God. And in particular, we have forgotten the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. In fact, as we go to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 1, listen to what the wise man tells us here. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and beginning in verse number 9. Why do we have to recall the past dealings of God's people? Why do we have to study sacred and ancient history. Isn't it old? Isn't it ancient? Does the past have any bearing on the future? Do we believe that history repeats? The Bible tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 1 beginning in verse 9, if you would have a key to the future, then we must understand the past because it is a blueprint, it is a pattern as to what shall be. And Ecclesiastes 1.9 says, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new? It hath been already of old time, which was before us. There is no remembrance of what? Former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of the things that are to come with those that shall come after. Do you see verse 11? Verse 11 is telling us that if we don't understand the former things, then neither will we understand the things that are going to come upon this earth. The former things is the past. The things that are to come, that's the future. If we don't understand the former things, we won't understand the future. And so the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and the thing which is done is that which shall be done. There's nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes 3, verse number 14. Ecclesiastes 3, beginning in verse number 14. God God has left us a a chart and a compass that points out every way mark on the heavenward journey, and we shouldn't have to guess at anything. 
But if I was to say, well, what is that chart and what is that compass, most people wouldn't even understand what the chart or what the compass is. And therefore, we don't understand the journey to the heavenward city. And we're guessing when we shouldn't have to guess at anything we ought to know, not to guess. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.14, I know that whatsoever God doeth it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. That which hath been is what? Now. And that which is to be hath what? Already been. And God require of that which is? We have nothing to fear for the future except we forget the way the Lord has led us and is teaching in our past history. So God requires that which is past. The thing that hath been is now. That which is to be hath already been. So what are these former things that we are to remember? That we may understand the things that are coming upon the earth. Isaiah 46 tells us what those former things are. Please turn to Isaiah chapter 46. Isaiah what chapter? Chapter 46. What are those former things that we need to remember, that we need to study, that we need to hear about, and not just because it's October 22 and 23, 1844, but it's definitely a good place, a good time to, to start and begin it. There definitely needs to be a denominational history course. We need to understand who our pioneers are. Millerite Adventists and Sabbatarian Adventist pioneers. We need to be able to have our children come to the front and to name each of them, men and women, and to give a short bio or synopsis on their contribution to Seventh-day Adventism. That's what we need to be able to do. But instead, no, they know who all the the rappers are, and all the actors are, and all the sports stars, and movie stars, and other stars I won't even make mention of, because we're going, because our children are wandering after the sun, and the moon, and the stars, and they don't realize that God has called them to be one of the seven stars that's in the right hand of Christ, that they follow the bright and morning star the root and the offspring of David, even Jesus Christ. So we're wandering after the beast instead of following the lamb whithersoever he goeth. Well, the Bible tells us in Isaiah 46, beginning in verse 8, Isaiah 46, 8 says, Remember this and show yourselves men. Bring it again to mind, O ye transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God. And there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from when? The beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country. Yea, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it and I will also do it. What are the former things? They are the things of prophecy, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel will stand and I will do all my pleasure. His purpose, his counsel, his pleasure is the more sure word of prophecy. So we have to understand prophecy. We have to understand sacred history. Why? Does God just want our minds to be filled with a bunch of facts and dates and historical places? Is that all? No, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed unto it as a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. How many want the day dawn, the day star, even Jesus Christ to arise in your hearts? Or Christ in you the hope of glory? That's what prophecy is for. There's a means to an end. There is an expected end to understanding prophecy and sacred history. And so the Bible lets us know that we have to understand the former things. We have to understand sacred history. We have to understand the uh, religious and prophetic movements of the past that we might understand what is on the horizon now as we talk about the movement of the loud cry of the third angel under the church 
triumphant, the final remnant, as it were, the complete fulfillment of Revelation 12, 17. And so now we go to the book of Psalm 74. The book of Psalm 74. This is the reason why Satan wants to bury this history. He doesn't want us to understand our pioneers. The self-sacrificing love, the dedication, the devotion that they had to the third angel's message. He doesn't want our youth to read the spirit of prophecy. He doesn't want these things taught in our schools and institutions. He doesn't want the councils practiced in these institutions, whether they be medical, educational, or, or publishing. He doesn't want them taught in our Sabbath school classes or in our churches or even read from the pulpit. But instead, he wants infidel authors and authors and ministers from the Babylonian churches to be read and to be taught and revered in our congregations. No wonder our youth go out into the world. No wonder our theologians and pastors go out from among us giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. If you were firmly rooted and grounded in the truth as it is in Jesus, and you remember the way the Lord has led us and is teaching in our past history, it would be a sign on your hand, and it would be also a memorial between thine eyes that the law of the Lord might be in your mouth, and no one could shake you. No one could get you tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. But the Bible says in Psalm 74 that the enemy has stolen a march upon us and, and Satan works from within to destroy God's people. He, he first starts from without, but he's more effective and successful when he gets his agents and his decoys to come within the congregation. In Psalm 74, beginning in verse 2, listen, Psalm 74, 2, remember... Thy congregation which thou hast purchased of old. The rod of thine inheritance which thou hast redeemed. This Mount Zion wherein thou hast dwelt. So hold on a minute. What is the congregation that the Lord has purchased of old or redeemed of old? What's the name of the congregation? Mount Zion. Let me ask you a question. Well, how old did he purchase it? Because he said of old he's purchased Mount Zion. This is his church. This is his congregation. How old is Mount Zion? How old is it? 6,000? Amen. That's good, but I think we can go a little bit beyond before creation in human history. Now listen, you can't really go that when I say before 6,000 years, I mean, it doesn't leave a lot of room. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation, which is in the sides of the... That's Mount Zion. That's, that's how old Mount Zion is. In heaven. So think about that. Mount, mount Zion on earth, just a reflection of the Mount Zion that's in heaven. You do know that there's an eternal city called Mount Zion. Hebrews 12, 22 and 23 says, but you are come unto Mount Zion. And it talks about how this is the general assembly of the church of the firstborn that's written in heaven to, to a city of innumerable company of angels and of the just, the spirits of just men made perfect, written in heaven. So there's a heavenly congregation called Mount Zion. And uh, that is the membership where our name should be written, by the way. You know that when we're told that not one in 20 had their names written upon the books that are in heaven, many have them written on the earth, but they're not written in heaven. We need to make sure that our names are written in the books of heaven and, be, and have membership of this church. 
whether you are regular lines or irregular lines, whether you are Ephraim or Judah, your name needs to be written in the books of heaven. That's where it counts. The Bible goes on to say now in verse 3, Lift up thy feet unto the perpetual desolations, even all that the enemy have done wickedly. Where? In the sanctuary. Where is the enemy working? In the sanctuary. And this sanctuary, by the way, is not just the wilderness tabernacle that Moses made, or even that which Solomon constructed, or, or that which was built after the 70-year exile under Zerubbabel and Joshua and Ezra and Nehemiah, but this sanctuary is a symbol of God's congregation or God's church that was purchased of old in Mount Zion. And you might say, well, how was it or when was it purchased? Jesus is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, 8. And 1 Peter 1, verses 18 to 20. But the Bible goes on to tell us now in verse number 4. Thy enemies roar in the midst of thy congregations. They set up their ensigns for signs. Where is the enemy working? Inside of the church, not outside. We're always worried about movements that are outside the church. But Satan is working within the congregation. That's where the enemies are roaring in the midst like lions from Babylon, they're roaring in the midst of our congregation. They set up their ensigns or their banners for sign in the congregation, it says. Look at verse 5. A man was famous according as he had lifted up axes upon the thick trees, but now they break down the carved work thereof at once with axes and hammers. They have cast fire where? Into thy sanctuary, they have defiled by casting down the dwelling place of thy name to the ground. And when you look at the margin for they have cast fire into your sanctuary, it means they've actually taken the sanctuary and cast it into the fire. What fire is that? The fires of strange fire. The fires of the torch of false prophecy. The fires that were used to offer their children in sacrifice to Moloch, the fires of spiritualism. Now, the Bible goes on to say in verse 8, they said in their hearts, let us destroy them together. They have burned up all the synagogues of God in the land. So you can see, where does the enemy want to work again? Inside. Inside. That's where he wants to work. That's where he sets up his banners in the midst of the congregation of Seventh-day Adventist churches. Whether you are mainline or shortline, it matters not. Satan wants his banner in the midst. Why? What did Jesus say in Matthew 24, 15? When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place where it ought not to be, Whosoever readeth, let him understand. Satan wants his abominations in our churches. Not outside, but inside. That is his work. He wants to burn up our churches, throw the sanctuary message and pillar into the fires, burn it up, destroy it, and replace it with his inside. Isn't that what Satan wants to do? Doesn't he want to change God's law and substitute it with his own laws? That's exactly what he has done. That's what he wants to do. Parade his banners in our church. What is our banner? It's the three angels' messages. We're going to study that and, and prove that from Scripture and Spirit of Prophecy. But what did Sister White say she saw in vision? She saw men in our church, men in responsible positions that said, listen, we don't need to have the striking features of our faith held out so prominently. We want to be able to have um, an influence with the other churches. So what they said is, let's take down our banner. And then we'll put up their banner instead that we might draw them and win them. It's the same thing that happened in the days of Constantine the Great where the Christians thought, well, listen, maybe I know these pagans aren't truly converted, but maybe we can um, let them see that, um, well, um, Sunday, if we make it 
the Lord's Day or the Day of Jesus, or we could, we could say that it, they, they believe it's for the sun god, but we'll say it's, it's in the honor of the resurrection of Christ. See, so for the pagans, they'll be comfortable and they'll come in, and for the Christians, well, we'll be gaining new converts. And so why, why is it that we have to compromise? Why do we have to lay down our back? Why do we have to give up truth? In order to bring people in. Shouldn't they give up their idols? No, we say, no, we'll, we'll baptize your idols. We'll sanctify them, Christianize them, give them a different name, and then bring them into the church. And we know they're not converted. We know they don't know the truth, but we'll let them teach Sabbath school. Hey, we'll let them write the Sabbath school quarterly. Brethren, what is the result of this work that Satan is doing within the congregation. Listen, what is the end result? Look, look at verse 9 with me. Verse 9. We see not our signs. There is no more any prophet, neither is there among us any that knoweth how long. Wow. This is the fruit of Satan's work. In the church. Listen. In case you missed it. We see not our signs. Number one. First angel. Neither is there no more any prophet among us. Second angel. And there's no one among us that knows how long. Third angel. I can't believe how much time has already elapsed. I feel like we're just now getting into the heart of the message right here. Lord, what do you want us to do? Shall we continue? Or shall we close the book and seal it up for the time of the end? And have a tarrying time. And at the appointed time, we open the book again. What should we do? Notice what the Bible goes on to say now in verse 10. O God, how long shall the adversary reproach? Shall the enemy blaspheme thy name forever? Why withdrawest thou thy hand, even thy right hand? Pluck it out from thy bosom. For God is my king of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. Thou didst cleave the fountains and the flood. Thou dried up mighty waters. Wait a second. What is, what is the psalmist doing here? He's showing you how the sanctuary, our congregation, our signs, our prophet, how long, all that's been destroyed, all that's gone. They've set up their own banners and their own ensigns in the church. The black banner of Satan. The bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel has been removed and now the black banner of Satan has been set up in our church. An idolatrous standard is set up. In our church, an image of jealousy that many are bowing down to when they come into the congregation. But then what does the psalmist say? Lord, why is your right hand in your bosom? You need to pluck out your right hand from your bosom and you need to work salvation. Then he begins to talk about how you divided the sea you dried up the, the rivers and the fountains of the flood. What is this talking about? Where, where is the psalmist bringing our mind back to? To past history and teaching. Amen. And what past history and teaching in particular where he dried up the, the sea for his people and provided a, a, a way for the ransom of the Lord to pass through on dry ground? The Exodus which for us takes us back to 1844. You see, that is the beginning of rebuilding the old waste places, raising up the foundations of many generations. 
repairing the breach and being the restorer of paths to dwell in. There is a work for Nehemiah and Ezra to do. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Raise them back up. But in order to raise them back up, you have to understand how the Lord has led in our past teaching and history. So what are our signs that we don't see anymore? Because the end signs of the enemy are there. Why is it that there's no more prophet among us any longer? And nobody knows anymore how long. How long has the preacher been preaching for? No. Not that how long, which, which has not been long. Amen. But no one knows anymore how long. This is where we're going to pause and tarry for a time. And we will continue with part two of Lest We Forget. And we'll begin at this same scripture. And we'll go through these points and we'll take our time. I don't, I don't want to be rushed. Do you, do you like to, to, when you're sitting down and eating, do you, do you sit down and eat when you're in a hurry? We shouldn't do that. That's, that's definitely not practicing health reform. We need to be able to take our time and to chew it slowly. So we're not going to rush. What God has given is sufficient. Take the book and eat it up. It's sweet like honey, but there is a bitter that will follow after. May we not forget, but may we remember and revive the message that was given in 1843 and in 1844. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name we come to thee. We thank you for what we've been able to, to disclose by the Holy Spirit and by the word of the living God. And we're praying, Father, that you will help us to be a part of that mighty restoration movement that will transpire in the last days. Where you will send Elijah the prophet represented as your people to join the hearts of the fathers to their children and the children to their fathers lest you come and smite the earth with a curse. We are under siege. We are under attack. And the enemy has set up his ensign throughout our congregations. We're praying, Father, that you would give us ISAV and that you will grant that our hands and our feet can be consecrated to the work of restoration and redemption, to repairing the breach, that we might be able to return back and understand how you have led us and your teaching in our past history, that we could teach it to our children that you could pour out your spirit upon them and use them mightily as you did in the time of the Waldensian Christians. Even in the time period of the great Second Advent movement beginning in Europe and also even in America. But Father, we're asking that it would be a sign on our hand and as a memorial between our eyes that your law can be in our mouth. That we could have a generation that would know the Lord and the works that he has done for Israel. And that they would no longer apostatize and fall away from truth and bow down to the gods of the other denominations that are around them. Thank you, Father, for the sacred history. Thank you for our prophetic heritage and legacy. And help us, Father, to remember the things the former things of old, for you are God and there is none else, there is none like you. We give you our hearts. We give you our mind. We give you our souls. In full surrender, asking that you would work within us both to will and to do of your good pleasure today. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.